and welcome to this new episode of the role model sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam speech is a gift from allah azza wa jal and allah favored us over other creations of his with this blessing and the way a person talks is indicative of his intellect. Amr ibn al-As, may Allah be pleased with him, said that a person's tongue is a piece of his mind, which means that when you speak, this is an indication of your caliber and what a person you are. Jabir ibn Samura, may Allah be pleased with him, used to describe the Prophet والسلام, as a person who would prolong his silence and laugh a little. And this is a sign of wisdom, of dignity, that you don't spill your guts all over the place. Rather, you maintain your honor, you don't talk without any legitimate reason. And when you do, you don't take the whole hour or the whole event spending it on talking just for people to look at you and to listen to you. Without any doubt, the Prophet والسلام, was the most articulate person to have ever uh, uh, speak in the language of the Arabs or any other language. He said about himself, alayhi salatu wasalam, I was given the concise of speech, meaning that it's a gift from Allah Azza wa Jal to speak few words and it, these words contain so much information and value that you may need volumes to write them down in. For example, one of the most known hadiths to everyone. Verily, deeds are judged by intentions. There is no form of worship that this hadith is not involved in. And every single book that Muslims have written include this hadith. Also the, beaut <coughs> the beautiful phrase, the beautiful sentence, the legal maxim, la darara wa la dirar. Neither causing harm nor reciprocating harm. Don't do this. This is a law. In two words, la darara wa la dirar. And you can cascade this to all aspects of life. Also, the beautiful legal statement that all jurors and judges and those dealing with the law know. And this is one of the most needed laws to be implemented. Al-bayyinatu ala man idda'a wal yameenu ala man ankar. Someone comes and accuses me of taking his money, of raping his sister, of a shameful act. Anyone could accuse me of doing this. Should we listen to him? The Prophet said, no, والسلام, He has to provide the evidence to prove his allegation. Anyone, woman coming and pretending that or claiming that someone raped her. Should we hang him? Of course not. She might be a big liar. Give us the proof that can stand in a court of law, not just allegations and tears and the likes. If that person claiming is false or is unable to bring evidence to back his claim, the Prophet says, والسلام, Then the accused 
must swear by Allah that he did not do this. End of story. 95% of people's allegations and cases are solved through this magnificent phrase. He was given the concise of speech. And the Prophet as described by Mother Aisha, when he spoke, he didn't speak like 60 miles per hour. He wasn't fast and just throwing words right, left, left and center. Rather, he used to speak in a very eloquent and articulate fashion that everyone understands every single letter that he is saying. And she says that if a person wanted to count the number of words that come out of the Prophet's mouth, alayhi salatu wasalam, they could have done that. Anas bin Malik says, when the Prophet spoke, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, sometimes, not all the time, sometimes, when needed, he would repeat what he had said three times so that people would comprehend it. And this is a form of drawing people's attention and ensuring that what was said is not to be neglected. Once he came and saw his companions performing wudu and they were very tired after a very long journey. And he noticed that some of them, due to being to so tired, they were not washing their feet and heels properly. So only the top of the foot. So he said three times, وَيْلٌ لِلْأَعْقَابِ مِنَ النَّارِ Woe to these heels from hellfire. And he repeated it thrice. And you can guess what impact this left upon those who were making wudu. Also, the Prophet ﷺ would give salam three times when wanting to enter a house. And this is like ringing the bell. So it's say, Assalamu alaikum, adkhul, no response. Assalamu alaikum, adkhul, shall I come in? No response. Assalamu alaikum, adkhul, if there is no response, he would go and leave. And also the Prophet once was sitting with his companions in the well-known hadith to all of you. And he said, shall I not tell you about the biggest of all major sins? And he repeated this question three times. So you can imagine the audience's attention to what was coming afterwards. And the Prophet Sallallahu rhetoric was straight to the heart because he used to select and choose the best of words. Dhimad ibn Thalaba, when the Prophet was in Mecca alayhi salatu wasalam, heard of a man and he's, they told him that he's crazy, he's insane. And Dhamad was someone who did ruqya and did exorcism. He dealt with taking the jinn out of the people. Though he was not a Muslim, but he had this ability in him. So he went to the Prophet and said, listen, I know how to cure insane people. So would you like me to help you? The Prophet ﷺ did not say to him, what do you think? You think I'm crazy? I'm mad? Get out of my face. No. The Prophet replied to him with these beautiful words. إِنَّ الْحَمْدَ لِلَّهِ نَحْمَدُهُ وَنَسْتَعِينُهُ مَنْ يَهْدِهِ اللَّهُ فَلَا مُضِلَّ لَهُ وَمَنْ يُضْلِلْ فَلَا هَادِيَ لَهُ وَأَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمَّا بَعْد The man said, whoa, hold your horses down. Repeat this. And the Prophet ﷺ repeated it three times. Then the guy said, listen, I've traveled the world. I heard th soothsayers' wordings, fortune tellers, those possessed by jinn. 
I've heard the poets, I've heard orators, I've never heard anything similar to what comes out of your mouth. And this is the most optimum of all rhetorics. And the man accepted Islam on the spot. Beautiful words that come out of his mouth. And the Prophet Sallallahu was also, in a, in a way, as we use this terminology, diplomatic. In the sense that whenever he wanted to say something that might be repulsive to some, he would pave the way. Because it has, has to be said. So in a hadith, once the Prophet addressed the companions, he said, listen, I am to you as a father to his children. So I teach you. When you defecate, do not face the qibla or you give your backs to it. And he orders of three stones to cleanse yourself with, which is like toilet tissues and three wipes minimum. And he forbade them from using dung or bones in cleaning themselves. And he prohibited a person to clean himself using his right hand. So the prophet gave an introduction to his teachings with these beautiful words, I am like a father to his children. Sometimes when he spoke, he used to swear by Allah Azza wa Jal, to put emphasis on what he says. Though everybody believes him, but this is needed to draw your attention and to give importance to what you're about to say. And he usually used the word or the phrase, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ By whom my soul is in his hands. In other incidents, the Prophet ﷺ would pause a question so that he would draw their attention. Like in the well-known hadith, أَتَدْرُونَ مَنِ الْمُفْلِسِ Do you know who is a person who's broke? And they said, the one who doesn't have money. Then the, he clarified it to them, said, no. He's a person that comes on the Day of Judgment with lots of prayers, fasting, charity, but he slandered this man, hit that man, backbit this one, shed the blood of that one, took the money of this one. So he comes on the Day of Judgment and he gives each one he had wrong done from his good deeds. And if his good deeds are over before giving back what he owes to people, then they give him from their bad deeds and then he would be thrown into hell. This is someone who's truly broke. So, was the Prophet والسلام, a person who's described as loud? So that we know people when they speak in gatherings, they're so loud, they're so dominant, you can't hear anything except what they say. <clears throat> Was he like this? Well, Al-Miqdad, may Allah be pleased with him, says, whenever the Prophet ﷺ entered a gathering or a room or a hall, he would give, he would give the salam to a level that someone who's awake can hear. But someone who's asleep would not be awakened by. So the Prophet's tone was very moderate and very delicate. <clears throat> he would not enter like every time we're in the masjid, especially in Ramadan, before prayer time or during uh, uh, between Adhan and Iqama. People come into the masjid, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Why are you shouting? Why are you giving salam as if you're the imam for everybody? And this is 
not a single person. You get like 50, 70 people coming in, everybody's shouting his head off. This is not from the Sunnah. Yes, if you come and pray to Rak'ahs and there's someone you know, you privately say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, shake hands, no problem in that. But the Prophet, when he entered the room, he would say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. So those who awake can hear, but those who are asleep would not be bothered by his salam. And when it was needed, he would raise his voice. As in the case of Friday khutbah. He's giving a speech. He's addressing thousands of people. It's not logical to speak about hell and heaven and about warning people of the day of judgment from the day of judgment by saying, and you have to fear the day of judgment. And hellfire is frightening. It is so hot. It is so uh, intimidating. People will fall asleep. No. The Prophet ﷺ, whenever he gave a khutbah, he would raise his voice and his uh, uh, cheeks would uh, grow and his veins would appear as if he's warning the people, there's a, an army coming to attack you. Just now, how would a person warning people from an army coming to attack them? He would definitely shout at them. And this is also to draw their attention. The Prophet والسلام, would use a lot of parables or examples. So he would say, uh, uh, and he would use his hands gesture to illustrate. So he would say, those who remember Allah and those who don't, or the house that people remember Allah in it, and the house does not remember Allah in it, it's like a dead person and a living person. And he would show it and illustrate it through gestures by saying, I was sent and the hour like this. And he would show the resemblance between the index and the middle finger. So this is him and this is a day of judgment. The distance or the timeline is very close to one another. And sometimes he would throw puzzles also to draw people's attention. The Prophet said once, والسلام, there's a tree that its leaves never fall. And it's like a Muslim. It resembles a Muslim. Tell me about it. So everybody was giving their guesses about the plants they know. And then the Prophet said, it is the palm tree. And this shows you that the resemblance between a Muslim and a palm tree. And finally, the Prophet ﷺ used a very needed etiquette for us today when talking. He would not publicize people's names in the public. So Aisha says, if the Prophet ﷺ was told something negative about a person, the, the Prophet ﷺ would never go and say publicly, why did so-and-so, and name the person, why did Abdullah do this or say this? Like in the hadith of Ibn al-Lutbiyyah, a man the Prophet dispatched وسلم, to collect the zakat money. So the man came after a few weeks and said, O Prophet of Allah, this is the zakat money I collected from all the different tribes, and this is a gift that was given to me. So the Prophet ﷺ got onto the pulpit, praised Allah, offered salutation upon the Prophet ﷺ and said, why do we employ people to collect the zakat and they come back to us saying that this is your zakat and this was given to me? On what basis they were given a gift? Shouldn't they stayed in their father and mother's home and see whether people would give them a gift or not? The answer is definitely not. Because this is a bribe. Had you not been an employee by the government or by the Prophet 
Nobody would have come to your house and said, listen, Akhi, this is a gift for you. But because you're collecting zakat, they're, cut, they're wanting you to cut them some slack. And this is why they're giving you something underneath the table. And this is a bribe. In this hadith, the Prophet did not say, why did Ibn al lutbiyah did so and so and so? He just simply said it vaguely and generally. And this is an etiquette we Muslims need. If you go to YouTube or Instagram or whatever they call them, Snapchats and social media, you will find brothers mentioning by name this da'i, this scholar, this individual, and stripping them, actually, metaphorically, that is. Otherwise, it would have been a rated R. They were stripping them and exposing them, and they said this, and they said that, and they said that. And it's back and forth between them. It's like volleyball, throwing the ball from one court to the other. And they're wasting the Muslims' times. And they're slandering one another. And they're losing a lot of good deeds. And each one of them say, I'm doing it for the sake of Allah. I'm exposing him so that I would warn the Muslims. And it's all a, a private a vendetta. It's all something inside their hearts filled with malice and envy and may Allah protect us all. Yeah, you want to warn against someone? Don't mention them by name. Just say, generally speaking, don't follow this uh, uh, way of thinking. Follow the mainstream of scholars, trusted scholars, someone who's not controversial. Instead of saying, Sheikh so-and-so, or Dr. so-and-so, or Da'i so-and-so, and you fill people's hearts with malice and, and hatred, rather than filling it with peace and deen and proper knowledge.